It was her 75th birthday and he was holding the mic. His wrinkled hands, a bit shaky, even standing straight seemed to be a task for him now. And his memory, everything he once was, was being wiped away by Alzheimer's. He was slowly forgetting himself. And yet, he remembered one thing quite clearly. All I ever wanted to do was to play cricket. But then I saw her. The story that followed though, it isn't a love story. It's a story of cricket. Cricket that brought two lives together. Cricket that shaped their future. And cricket that connected two fates that were fated to be sheared apart. This is a story of cricket in which love stayed alive between spaces of words that were never spoken. The year is 1959. A 24-year-old youngster has landed in Mumbai to study law. And the first thing he does as soon as he reaches here, he tries to find a place to play cricket. This was Raj Singh, the youngest son of Maharwal Lakshman Singh Ji, the king of Dungarpur. He was royalty, but what ran in his blood wasn't kingship, it was cricket. In the last few years, as he studied in Indore, books, politics, even life came a distant last to cricket. The son of a king in a time when caste divide was well and alive in India. He used to spend days after days sweating blood and tears along with commoners. Such was his passion, his dedication, that he was selected into the Rajasthan Ranji team at just 20 years of age. The national team was just around the corner. But then his father intervened. Cricket is fine for fun and games, but you will earn an education that's worthy of your name. In 1950s, where even a normal father's words were a royal decree and actual king's orders, they weren't something that you could just debate. So off he went to Mumbai to stay at his sister's place and to become a lawyer. But now, as he reached there, he would quickly tell his friend Sopan Sardesai, I cannot exist without playing cricket. Please take me somewhere I can play. Sopan Sardesai, who till recently used to live in a chawl, only near his own stomping yard, Valkeshwar House compound, where he and his friends used to play tennis cricket. So, asking a Ranji player to play Galli cricket. But Raj Bhai, on looking at Sopan's hesitation, quickly said, I don't care who plays or what you play, I have to play cricket. And so off they went in what was soon to become a tradition of sorts. Finish college, run to the ground and then go back to your sister's place at Nipin Sea Road. Day in and day out, on and on it went. Till one day, one of his newly minted friends said, Listen, we live just behind this building and my family wants to meet you. They are very curious about this Ranji player that plays tennis cricket with us. <laughs> this friend with his unique demand was a 22-year-old Vridhainath Mangeshkar. He and Sopan used to be neighbours in the chawl back in the day. But now, Ridhainath had become somewhat of a celebrity. He had composed a few songs in movies and apparently his sister was a singer or something. But that didn't matter much. What mattered was that Ridhainath seemed always ready to play cricket. And now that Rajbhai realised, he lives so close to the ground. Just imagine the possibilities it could bring. He could just sleep at his place and start playing from the morning itself. What more does a guy want in life? So, filled with cricketing dreams, on he rushed to his friend's house, where he saw her. She was standing there, smiling, asking whether he would like tea. A 69-year-old Rajbhai would still remember smiling me. She was utterly charming that day. She sat with me and talked the entire time. She even came to see me off and gave me her car key so that I wouldn't have to walk back home. A few days later, he would be called back to the house. The Mangeshkar family was celebrating Narar Purnima. The entire house was cackling in fun and joy, with Rajbhai regaling the entire family with stories of his Ranji stint. And she, she was just sitting there, listening. That girl was Lata, Lata Mangeshkar. At that point, she wasn't yet the nightingale of India for sure. But her voice had created numerous hits in the past 11 years. That 30-year-old maestro, whose voice could even make grown men cry, she was now just sitting there, spellbound at the stories of a 24-year-old. And so, it started. Raj became a frequent visitor to the Mangeshkar house. Lata was originally from Indore, while Raj had studied there. So, amid childhood nostalgia and youthful adventure, among conversations of cricket and movies, slowly and gradually, something started simmering. And all of this, while Lata's family was smiling approvingly. 
This was their eldest daughter, somebody who had raised them after they had lost their father when she was just 13. Somebody who had worked tirelessly for the last 17 years so that she could support her three younger siblings. Somebody who had bared the burdens of the world completely alone. So they smiled as Rajbhai's home visits became visits to her recording sessions, to her singing programs, to her felicitations, much to the surprise of Raj's new friends. They would find him sitting in the Mangeshkar house even when they were playing cricket down below. For the first time in his life, he had found something that was even more interesting than cricket. Life seemed like a perfect romantic story for a moment. The girl above, his cricket below and an ever after ahead. But then, life happened. The details are a bit hazier. Either rumours reached the king's ear or Raj had himself gone to his father for his approval. Either ways though, the king went berserk. The girl was of a different class, a different hierarchy with absolutely no royal pedigree. And most importantly, she was six years older than the prince. Even today, in Indian society, marrying an older girl is frowned upon. Imagine it happening in 1950s. So the king had made his decision. His prince could never marry somebody like her. And so Rajbhai now had a decision to make. The girl or the family. If he would choose the former, it would be a stain on royal blood. And in the uncertain time after independence, where the new positions in the society were still unsure, this might as well have been the death of their royal umbrage. He might destroy his entire family by his very own hands. But on the other hand, he wouldn't have her. It's unknown how long did he fight with this decision. But by the time he reached Mumbai, he had made his decision. He would choose both. He would choose neither. He would listen to his father and he wouldn't marry the girl. But if he couldn't marry the girl, he would never get married. Ever. He had made his decision and now Lata had to make hers. Why should she hold on to someone that wouldn't fight for her? Doesn't she deserve a family of her own? She had to make a decision now. Him or her own family. And her decision? Well, her actions spoke much louder than her words ever could. Because for all intent and purposes, nothing seemed to have changed. She still insisted on Raj being there. At her house, at her recordings, at her functions. For her, being alone was nothing new. She had been alone for most of her life. But what she refused to be anymore was lonely. She would have him in her life. She would not be lonely. She would be happy. And so turned the years. Rajbhai finished his law degree and promptly threw it away to continue to play cricket while Latadi climbed higher and higher through the ranks of Bollywood. Such was her shine that even her name could guarantee a record music sale. Such was her rise that by the time 1970s came by, she was being called for concerts outside India, from Russia to China, everywhere except England. Because for England, film music like this was better suited in school cafeterias. Music halls was for classical music. And that statement irked Latadi. She decided, my first performance outside India will be in London. And that too, in the prestigious Albert Hall. She would show the English her music. However, realizing this would prove to be a challenge. No amount of diplomacy was working, nor did any monetary benefits seem to shift the needle. Even the government interceding on her behalf had no effect. And as everything seemed lost, she got a call. The director of Albert Hall had suddenly agreed she could perform there. That night, as she performed to a packed Albert house, what she couldn't see was Rajbhai, who had taken a ticket with his own money and was now sitting in the last row making sure she couldn't see him. That he had travelled to London a few months back. That he had used all of his connections to get into a meeting with the Albert Hall trustees. That he had made her wish come true. He wanted her music to succeed. Whereas Latadi, seemingly over time, had adopted Rajbhai's love for cricket. She would attend each and every match that was played at the Vankhades. No matter the day, no matter the time. It's to the point that even her recording sessions were scheduled as per the schedule of the Indian cricket team. Such was her craze 
that Rajabhai had went and bought a house overlooking the Lord Stadium in London so that she could watch matches right from its balcony without the hassle of getting into the stadium. This was the same house where Latadi would call the entire Indian cricket team whenever her music tour seemed to coincide with India's tour of England. And it was the same house where she had spent a sleepless night just before the finals of the 1983 World Cup. The next day, as Kapil's daredevils lifted the World Cup, they found Lata Mangeshkar standing and cheering in the stands as a surprised Kapil Dev invited her over for dinner with Raj Bhai standing right behind him. But as celebrations went on, Raj Bhai on returning to India would face a dilemma. He till this point had retired from cricket and had become a respectable name in the BCCI. And now they had no money to give to the returning champions. They had managed to somehow conjure up a reward of 25,000 rupees per player. But such a paltry sum to the returning champions. It would be an insult to India's image. And so Raj Bhai came up with an idea. He first contacted Latadi and informed her of this issue, knowing full well how she is going to respond. And as soon as she confirmed, he quickly put forward an idea of a musical program in Delhi, where not only will the team be felicitated, but it could be used as a donation drive for the team. BCCI happily okayed the idea. And on 17th August 1983, Latadi created a two hour long musical magic. She had even brought a completely new song that was composed for this event by her brother Hrithay Nath Mangeshkar. By the time the night ended, BCCI had managed to collect 20 lakh rupees. That's one lakh for each player. And then when they tried to give a share of this money to Latadi, she simply smiled and walked away. She wouldn't even let them cover her traveling costs. The next 30 years would be rife with small incidents like this. From Raj Bhai becoming the chairman of the selection committee and selecting a 16-year-old boy to play against Pakistan in Pakistan. The same boy who would later go on to acknowledge Latadi as her mother. A boy called as Sachin Tendulkar. Anyways though, in thousands of other such incidents, one thing would remain common. Whenever the pressures of the world would become too much, when life got too lonely, off to London, both of them would go in that small flat where days would be spent sipping tea and watching cricket. It's to the point that on that night of 17th August, when Latadi had refused to take any money from the BCCI, the BCCI on their front had gone ahead and declared. From that day on, there would always be two tickets waiting for her at the Van Khede Stadium. No matter when, no matter what match, she could just walk in and take her seat at zero cost. And why exactly, you may ask, were there two seats reserved instead of one? Well, because even back then, people knew with whom exactly did she like to watch cricket with. That person, as he took the stand on the celebrations of a 75th birthday, with a hand that couldn't hold the mic properly, with eyes that now had trouble seeing, and a memory that kept fading away due to a disease that would take his life five years later. He could still remember every minute detail of the girl that he had met that day. And when he was invariably asked by the press about his relationship with her, he answered with a rueful smile, I am already married to cricket. He was married to cricket and she was married to her music. Both of them never got married. Both of them didn't have a family of their own. But this were two people who in spite of destiny's machinations to pull them apart, had held on to each other, making the other person their home. So yes, he was married to cricket. And yes, she was married to music. And yet, in spite of that, and despite of that, they lived happily ever after. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you have a good day. I hope to see you again. Thank you.